And we're back. It's your boy, Eduardo Jackson, CEO, founder, creator of the great Cinema Draft and Draft Stream Games, where daily fantasy sports meets the movies and streaming content. Welcome <laughs> back to our own very essential worker, the molder of young minds, educator extraordinaire. It is Jen Risky. Hello, hello. Happy to be back. Yes, yes. Welcome back. Welcome back. Tonight's Andy Cohen inspired Watch What Happens lifestyle drinking game tonight shall be the word cowboy. Because every time you hear that one of us say this word, take a sip of what you're sipping. Since tonight we'll end up covering all of our favorite movies from the cowboy <laughs> capital of the world, Tejas. All right. So, as per my notes, I'm still distressed. People are going back to school. They're getting sick like crazy. The social contract's on fire. People aren't wearing masks. People are being dumbasses. Florida still exists. I'm desperate for some, for some good news, Jennifer. Tell me something good, Jen. Um. Well, I, the school year, despite some complications on Monday, is off to a good start. I always look forward to meeting students, even if I'm not totally prepared, you know, so we're doing all right. Uh, you have such a big heart for those big, fat super spreaders. All right, love it. Love no, it. I'm I'm remote. <laughs> oh, good, good, good. Because I, I remember there was some some chatter in our uh, Slack. Shout out Bransky Slack that uh, <laughs> I have to go back into work. So I was hoping that didn't. I mean, you know, Texas can be really dumb when it wants to be. So I'm glad. Oh, it, for sure. Yeah, I'm lucky enough to be working remotely this semester. So. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> perfect. All right. So the show with no segues. <laughs> And I ain't nobody got time for that. Well, okay, wrong button, but true. I ain't got time for segue. There we go. My air horn, my air horn. That's right. My favorite segment. What we're watching. Yes. And let me share my screen to show you what I am watching. And it is a great little show I just discovered, which I believe is on Hulu called Harlot. Oh, uh, yeah. It was, um, um, I think it was popular when Downton Abbey was still out, and so that was one of the big things that the actress who played Sybil is is in Harlots. <clears throat> yes, Lady Sybil. Yeah, all grown <laughs> up. All grown up. <laughs> I, I mean, I've seen her in reverse. I saw her earlier this year in Brave New World, and yeah, she's doing some grown woman things in that, so I was <laughs> for this uh, from that. But no, this is a great show about 18th century London sex workers and the bods, aka madams, who run them. And I I mean, I'm, I'm only in, I'm in season two, episode three, I think. And I'm just having the time of my life. This, I love being immersed into a world. You know how I love historical fiction. The performances are, are great. The, the fashion and the and the intrigue is, is all right there. I mean, the, I mean, the ex exploitation of sex workers, sadly, is as old as time. But I mean, yeah. even within their relative means of powerlessness, seeing seeing them, you know, seize power or at least their own sovereignty over their choices, it's been really interesting to watch. What what did, have you taken from watching uh, Harlots, and have you seen all of Harlots? Um, I actually haven't seen any of it. It's one of those that's like been on my been on my list forever, but I haven't I haven't seen it, unfortunately. Oh, okay. All right. No worries. Well, now you know a great new show to, to check out when you get a chance. Uh, yeah. sure, my girl, Laura, who turned me on to this like a year ago, finally got there. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Barely than ever. But uh, yeah, Harlots is, is good stuff and, uh, you know, plenty of sex to, to keep you interested. And and all and yeah and all these grand old English terms I love I love learning new words I've got an English degree and I love learning you know new words making up words whatever so I love you know culls which are like Johns the bods <laughs> the madams you know you know uh, and this great line which I think I might use in daily life called you're just unfit for purpose <laughs> <You're totally laughs> nice. useless you're just unfit for purpose yeah that's right. All right, so Harlots, that's what I'm watching. The other show I'm watching from our uh, draft stream game from last week, which resulted in our very own Henry, AKA Henner YYZ in the game, winning for his for the very first time in three weeks, the game. Good job, Henner YYZ. And it was the show The Vow, which catapulted him to his victory. Are you familiar with The Vow? I am very interested to watch, but I haven't seen any yet. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, I'm how many episodes is this gonna be? I, it, you know, we uh, I mean, let's see, so, I wonder if it's like a 10 episode thing or 
Yeah, because they spend the entire first episode, which I watched. Oh, it uh, looks like nine? Nine, nine episodes. Oh, uh, okay. That feels like stretching it. They Shows need to become more brit efficient. And by that, I mean yes. like yes. <laughs> six in, six out. You know, there's in and out uh, in six. Unless I May Destroy You, which was excellent, but they were going for a, a one-shot deal, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, the vow, it, they spend, it's basically about this cult uh, that, kind of got this actress who I'd never heard of before named Allison Mack in trouble for, I guess, promoting the cult and trafficking women for the cult. And they spend the entire first episode building up this cult. Like it's just basically this place where everybody's happy. And, but then at the very end of the first episode, you can see the little bit of a dark turn. So I'm, I'm interested to see where it's, it goes. I'm not sure if I'm nine episodes interested, but I'm interested. <laughs> and that's what I'm watching. What are you watching, Jen? Um, I, um, started Lovecraft Country. I'm caught up on that. Um, and it's kind of it very in my wheelhouse. So I'm interested really? to see tell how it how it's gonna go. Yeah. Tell us why you like Lovecraft Country because I'm it's about to lose me. I mean <laughs> so far it's been two weeks, it's been a different show each week. It's about mm -hmm. to lose. tell me why it's got you in its thrall. That's actually part of the reason why I like it. Um, and I'm also reading the book right now, which I don't I don't usually like to do, but I didn't get a chance to read it beforehand. Um, like it's just a the book is also a mishmash of all of these different genres. So I feel like the episodes kind of being all over the place are a reflection of that. I think the pilot, the 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 first episode was excellent. And the second one, I was just kind of like, okay, I'm going to buckle up and see what happens. <laughs> yeah, the second episode was, was quite disorienting. Uh, not necessarily even in a bad way. It's just, uh, and, and it's funny because Andy Greenwald on the podcast, which we all love, you know, The Watch, mentioned in the episode yesterday that it's kind of like, it not only does it throw everything at you, it goes so fast, doesn't bother to explain things, which normally I don't mind because I'm a pretty bright guy, but right. you're leaning into deep, heavy fantasy, and it seems like you're making up the rules as you go along. Uh, that's part of the reason why I you know, tapped out after what the third Harry Potter movie because it just seems like anytime something happens, they just make up a spell and they're out of it. And I understand right. now if you hadn't read the books, then you know it's not grounded in the reality of that situation. But in the movies and in this show, it just kind of felt really kind of made up. So I don't know. Lovecraft, you're on watch, you're on notice. You got one more episode to keep me in. Otherwise, I'm out. And in a in a famous uh, example of how one episode can make all the difference, I was I was this close to being out on Ted Lasso and then that marvelous fourth episode written by Jamie Lee happened and now I'm all the way in. So you never know. <laughs> and it's so it's so good to see um, Courtney B. Vance too. I'm a, I am watched a lot of Criminal Intent. So, you know, it's yes, good to see. Mr. Good to see him yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we love him. Right, anything else you're watching you want to mention? Um, I am I'm kind of late to the game on things a lot of the time. So uh, I just I just finished watching um, Watchmen recently. Ooh. That was amazing. So um, I really I really enjoyed that too. So mm -mm. well, yeah, well, and that, and that's a, that's a perfect example. I'm glad you brought that up, Jen. That's a perfect example or a juxtaposition of the type of kind of fantasy elements that work for me at least mm -hmm. versus those that you know really leave me you know questioning and, and on the outs like Lovecraft Country because Watchmen, it, it grounds itself in a reality that seems somewhat, you know, normal or similar, even though it's a bit of like an alt history or an alt universe where, you know, squids fall from the sky and stuff like that. But, right. the, but the way they do it, even in the, even in the pilot, I mean, it, it kind of, they kind of let you know what the rules are, even if the rules are absurd. I mean, yes, the squids, you know, drop from the sky, they just stop, you know, let the squid storm pass, just wipe it yeah. off. Your business right <laughs> or, or you have this uh this this center where you can like talk to the holograms of your loved ones or whatever it is or or, or call mars or whatever i mean you know it's it's out there but it's grounded right this is yeah it, they, they take time to kind of give it context it just seemed like you know throwing a lot at us last episode of lovecraft country not enough context but you know that's well it, and i was thinking about that quote from that you know um the, the andy's andy's quote that he says a lot of times that um, with regard to Lovecraft Country kind of being everywhere, that he he talks about how um, you know TV shows they t they teach you how to watch them, yes. and so I feel like they're they're still kind of figuring that out with Lovecraft Country. So I'm I'm giving it a chance. Excellent point. Well, you're reading the book too, so you're all in, which is fine. Which is 
I wish I could read a book. My head's so, you know, once I'm on, on the other side of the selection, maybe my mind can free itself up to read some fiction. Yeah. <laughs> it's, rough. it's rough. I, I envy you book readers. All right. Yes, let's jump right into it. Uh, top five Texas movies. I'm ready. <laughs> All right. So, which is our main theme of the episode this week. And the way it goes, you name a movie that takes place or uses the great state of Texas as a character, not just a, a movie that was filmed there, but actually uses the rich background of Texas and its people as part of the plot. We alternate picks. Once someone picks that movie, the movie is out of play. And I'm, I'm, I'm preemptively sad because I have a feeling where you're going to go. So go ahead and take it off the board. What is your first Texas movie? Dazed and Confused. Oh, okay. I can live with that. <laughs> I was sure that you were going to pick it first. So. It's in the mix, but it wasn't first. But yeah, go. Great. Go for it. Uh, uh, so I am from, uh, I'm from uh, a small town in Texas called Victoria. I live in San Antonio. So, um, you know, Texas movies are, are great interest to me. So I'm, I'm happy to, to share some of my favorites. And this is what immediately came to mind for me um, from Richard Linklater. And it, it's it's a great you know it's one of those movies I, recently you did um movies that take place in a day and so like this could also fit for that that category um that you get to see this little slice of like small town life and even though you know it's set in the 70s like that's very small town that texas life a lot of it is hasn't changed that much and so it just does a really good job of capturing that that time and you know in between being for most of the characters um their junior going into their senior year and all of the different things that can kind of happen and the alchemy between these different groups of people mm -mm. Yeah, and it's, it's been, God, I think I only saw this once and it was at least 10, 15 years ago. So I honestly don't remember much about it, but oh. I'm, I'm glad, I, I know, I'm, look, I know. You, know. <laughs> you have lots of movies to watch. <laughs> well, not only that, but I mean, it, it's not like I, I'm not against, it's not like I'm against rewatching movies. I rewatch movies all the time. It's just, I, I'm always, especially since, uh, since I started Cinema Draft four years ago and then now got into Draft Stream. I mean, once you know what's out there, like what's like contemporary with you, I mean, you'll never be bored. Like seriously, right? This <laughs> Absolutely. Game. game has been great for movie discovery, tile discovery. So, so I'm a little behind in some of my rewatchables, as it were. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know what? Screw it. I'll add this to the list. I need it. And you know, you've got you've got the iconic, you know, hazing scenes and things like that, like what's up up on the screen now. And Parker Posey is amazing. You know, it, it's just amazing as the you know the bitchy, uh, the the bitchy senior. And and um, of course, you know, you've got Matthew Matthew McConaughey's. You know, all right, all right, all right, all right. You know? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he's kind of creep. You know, he's he's a creep, but at the same time, it's like. The, there's always that guy who's dating the high school, you know, the, the, the line about, you know, they stay the same age, you know? Yeah. We, um, yeah. We get, uh, they say we, they stay the same age. We get older, something like that, or they yeah. get younger. <laughs> Just yeah. a creep, but like you still, you, you know, you, you have a soft spot for the guy. All right. Well, good first pick out the gate. Well, this is the one I was totally convinced you're going to take. My first pick is Friday night lights. Ooh. I can't believe that I made it through. Friday Night Lights, uh, not the TV show, obviously. This is a movie show. But Although, movie I, I was thinking about the TV show because, you know, that one of the characters in Lovecraft Country, she was also in the TV series for Friday Night Lights. I think really? her name was Erica. She, she dated uh, Michael B. Jordan. Her family had that restaurant in oh, the show. I, uh, I'm, wow, I'm kind of blanking on it. Okay, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, well, I mean, I, it's been, I mean, I watched Friday Night Lights, the TV show during its initial run. So it's been, it's been yeah. a while. But yeah, mm -hmm. I love the show more than the movie. But the movie was good. I remember rewatching it a few years ago and it holds up. Uh, Derek Luke is the cocky, uh, you know, Booby Miles, <laughs> referring to himself as a <laughs> person, all in on football. And then he gets that injury, which, you know, you know totally sidelines his career. Uh, Billy Bob Thornton is, you know, the, the, the coach is trying to, you know, get them to win state. You know, it really does show football as a religion in your yeah. you know, Lone Star State. I was, I was gonna say it is it is entirely accurate. Like I have lived Friday Night Life. 
you know? <laughs> and oh, I didn't yeah, even go to school yes, particularly yes, competitive, you know? Oh, Jay Hernandez, young Jay Hernandez in there. Yeah, oh, so, wow. so, so tell me, since you did live Friday Night Lights, was your high school football team any good? No, they were not particularly. Take over. We were good for like a small, crappy uh, Catholic school, you know. <laughs> but like, we would have not have been able to contend with like the the larger public schools in the area. And if we played, if we played public schools with like smaller towns, and we're talking like maybe ten thousand people in the town. So. <laughs> oh, okay. oh wow, Garrett Headland. I forgot he was in this. Yeah, wow. good, good movie. Good movie. Yeah, Peter Berg. <clears throat> this this really did kind of help. Well, actually, I think at this point, 2004, he already, I think he was on his way to doing The Kingdom, and he'd done some other interesting stuff. This one definitely did make him uh, be a, a directorial force to contend with. So Friday Night Lights, my first pick. What's cool. your second pick, Jen? Um, my second pick uh, is um, influenced by my husband, Tony, who uh, grew up here in San Antonio, and uh, it's Selena. <laughs> Oh, oh, with uh, Jennifer Lopez, and I thought you might also pick this one too. So, well, honestly, I, I might be, I might or might not be saving that for next week's show, which will oh. see our, our good friend uh, Stephanie, aka I like her Stevie, little Stevie. Uh, oh, she's that's awesome. through on our first all Latinx podcast, and oh. we're going to do American. Uh, American Latinx movies. So I, I might that's have. That's awesome. She's going to yeah. be great. So go ahead, tell us about Selena. Um, so um, one of the things that um, that my husband talked about is how um, this is really accurate and like this is this is pretty similar to like his own upbringing. He's very familiar with the story. For me, it's of course like this is Jennifer Lopez is a star. Whenever I saw this, you know, like you can't you can't deny that. Um, there's a big. And your scene. husband is Mexican American. Yes. Okay. Um, and um, there's a big scene in. Um, that where she's performing in the Alamo Dome and he and his family, uh, they were extras. They went to, you know, to go attend and everything. And um, it's one of those stories that you like to hear about stars that she was very enthusiastic and gracious and everything throughout the, the process of filming. <clears throat> so, and then of course I love her music. So. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, Lena. That was a good movie. I remember. Yeah, very yeah. Texas, and her hometown of Corpus is is pretty close to my hometown. Mm -mm. Oh, so you're down there by the coast, huh? Mm, yeah, yeah, coastish. <laughs> very cool. Yeah, Corpus mm -mm. Christi. All right, um, great second film. I'm playing the game and taking this one off the board. No Country for Old Men. Okay. Mm -mm. I mean, for all the you know all the nice you know Antoine Chigurh reasons. There we go. Javier Bardem, Oscar-winning role. Very creepy. Nice, desolate landscapes. Uh, the, you know, grizzled Texas lawmen like uh, Tommy Lee Jones and Barry Corbin. Let's right. talk about death, you know? <laughs> and all that good yeah. stuff. And Coen Brothers, yeah. What, what do you remember about this movie? I mean, the, co the coin toss scene. Like, <laughs> there's, you know... Um, between it's like this scene and the opening scene and in glorious bastards i feel like those are like both studies in like building building suspense and you're just on the edge of your seat wondering what's going to happen you know so yeah for sure yes this movie had me creeped out the entire way through so yeah well done, <laughs> so that, that's that's my second pick what's your third pick jen uh i'm going back to the link later well and i'm gonna say everybody wants some Oh, I have not seen this movie. Everybody. It is wonderful, and in some ways, I think it really does encapsulate actual Texas life more than Days and Confused is a little bit more universal. Whereas this is filmed um, at a town about thirty minutes from from uh, from where I live is filmed in that that area, and they're just they're doing things that like. You know, for instance, they're tubing down the river or they're going to this party out in the middle of a pasture somewhere like and also and this is another one of those like it takes place over a weekend. Um, but yeah, it, it definitely captures again like this pivotal time where, um, you know, he's the, the main character is discovering, you know, like what it is like to be part of this baseball team, but then also like moving from the, you know, the big fish in the little pond, that story. Um, and, you know, getting ready for, for college life at, um, 
you know, I don't think they call it Texas State, but um, it as it's <laughs> filmed at Texas State. <clears throat> oh, okay. Where is Texas State? Uh, in San Marcos. Oh, okay. And that's uh, about thirty minutes from me. So. Yeah, I'm gonna take a wild guess, but is this a period film? <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> so it's it's uh, often described, or Linklater himself describes it as a spiritual sequel to. Um, uh, two days and confused, and this is so. This is happening, I think, in '79, um, if I remember correctly. Oh. Um, so you also have that whole vibe to it as well. And um, they're popping in, as you can see from the photos. They're popping in and out of all of these different locations, trying these different identities on. You know, like you see them in punk outfits. You see them in like in shit kicker outfits. Um, you know, um, that that kind of thing. So. Um, also, the idea that identity is kind of fluid and trying and trying all those different things on. You have those same, like, very much like their archetypes. So you have like you know the 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 philosopher who's full of crap. You have the overly competitive dude. You know, like all of those different things. All right. So in the interest of multiple identities, tell me what was your best club name? What was the name you gave someone in the club when they asked you? You know, when they you know, they came over to holler at you in the club and you didn't necessarily want to talk to them. What, what's your best club name? Oh, I don't know. Mm -mm. Ever give uh, a club name? You always told me name. Hi, I'm Jen. <laughs> oh, Melissa. Sorry, I, <laughs> I thought I was giving the guy a nickname. You know, yeah, I always said Melissa. <laughs> hey, Misty, what up? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have any real good club names, but I know, I'll never forget freshman year. We hung out with this guy. His name was Stan Stanley, but he always went, but he used to go by, um, and we everyone called him Stan because you don't call like a black dude Stanley. At, when you're 17 year old in in the in the mid 90s in Atlanta, right? So he was <laughs> give himself a nickname. He called himself King, right? So everybody, so he made you call him King, whatever. Fine, you call him King. Have time. We get pissed and we call him Stan. But we go to a club <laughs> one time, and he told me, and he and he told me, you know, he told he's you know bragging about all the numbers he got or whatever. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. How did you do that? He's like, oh, it's gave him my club name. I'm like, oh, what's your club name? He's like, Che Guevara. What? <laughs> I'm like, what? I'm like, yeah. And, and back then, no. I mean, at least you know, 17 years old in Atlanta, we didn't really know what two Che Guevara totally was. I'd look it up later. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's kind of funny and kind of dumb. So, that's <laughs> name story, quick cultural cul-de-sac. We're moving on. My third film. <laughs> this is a dark story. It's a recent film. It's so Texas. It it makes it it hurts your eyes. Let's it's Boy it. State. Have you oh, seen I, I have not seen it yet, but I am very familiar uh, with the phenomenon. Mm -mm. Really? Oh, do you know someone who actually went to Boy State? I do. I know several someones. <laughs> are conservative? Are they all white? Are they all crazy? Are they power hungry? Are they running like packs right now? Are they hedge fund managers? What are they? What are they? What are they? What are they? <laughs> all of those things. <laughs> no! <laughs> <laughs> they're, no. they're not all they're not all white i don't you know that's probably about it you know uh so i went to a, a private like a, a catholic school so the it's pretty you know it's more like a circle than a venn diagram of you know people who would attend this so well let me bring those who are listening or watching at home up to speed on what boy state actually is Boy State, the movie, is a documentary film, cinema verite style, like damn near over the shoulder of four kids, four candidates at Boy State. When they get in, it's basically, and Boy State is basically this big thousand kid congregation of uh, assembly of, of Texas juniors, the Texas high school juniors. And I, I believe in Austin, I believe they take over the state capitol during Wall Street recess uh, for one week every August, I believe. And some of the notable alumni in Boys State include William Jefferson Clinton, uh, ugh, Rush Limbaugh. <laughs> um, I think they also showed, who they showed in the beginning? Um, well, there, there's a handful of people you've heard of who are Boys State alumni, right? right. And basically the, the goal is, so they basically take half the, the crowd there, 500 boys, they make them, into this, you know, mock party called the Federalists, and 500 into a mock party called the called the Nationalists, and they're supposed to figure out, you know, party platform among themselves. They're all supposed to run for some sort of office, everything down to, you know, county sheriff, all the way up to, you know, governor of this board. Okay. And and base and so and that, and that and basically you have them acting as you know parties individually you know electing each other all the way to the run up to the climax at the end of the week where the two 
candidates for governors from the opposing parties face off and then the entire congregation of boys have to vote on uh, one single governor so there's a lot of politicking going on a lot of trying to sway minds stuff and it all sounds nice and innocent on the top but this is politics and probably the worst time for politics in our nation's history and right. those lessons have not gone unnoticed these kids are something else there's, uh, I mean, look at this. This looks like they are largely conservative. They are largely white. It's, you know, really kind of, uh, I thought I was going to hate this movie at the beginning because, you know, you see your in your entree into it is, is this young boy named um, uh, Robert McDougal, classic um, feather feathery hair, uh, you know, classic Norman Rockwellian, all American, you know, looks whatever, you know, loves his guns and is going to go. Wearing vineyard vines and top ciders, you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, it, all, all he wants to do is go to West Point, right? You're like, oh, I'm going to hate this guy. He actually is a very interesting character who, you know, as we go through the movie, peels away some interesting layers to him that you might not have expected. But then you get to see some of these other boys, including this young man right here, Stephen Garza. I mean, kind of an unlikely hero he's he's a i wouldn't say he's a raging democrat but he's wearing a, a beto o'rourke t-shirt <laughs> going into the whole experience at first always excellent <laughs> yeah you, know, you know always you know among this 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 den of of conservative you know white people white white boys mm -hmm. uh, and he's soft-spoken but it's just amazing to watch his development through the course of the week there's actually i can actually point to a single uh, speech he gives where you can see his confidence and his personality just emerge as he's very speaks. cool yeah and and, and kind of gets <laughs> confidence and, and and decides he's going to run for governor or whatever and just watching him try to win over all these people with these totally you know diametrically opposed views of, of everything from from guns and abortion rights and th things like that it's kind of rally them to his cause it's just it's remarkable I mean, to the point where people had tears in their eyes at the end of the movie, you know, talking about how much he meant to them as far as like him as a candidate. So you got him on one end. Now on the far other end, and, and I'm gonna wrap this up, bring this in for landing, but I love this movie so much. It's it's one of the best movies I've seen this year. On the other end, you got this guy named Ben, there he is. Oh, he got, as Amanda uh, Dobbin says on the Big Picture podcast, he got the villain edit, but honestly, he is the villain edit. This guy, <laughs> Ben Feinstein, aka Feinstein for Freedom and Americanism, Ugh. he it, we first see him playing with a Ronald Reagan doll, just a future rights prebus in the making, amoral, political animal, untethered to any kind of ethics or 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 decency. Just, I mean, you really come to hate him, and you kind of and he's he's self aware enough to know that what he's doing is wrong. But he's like, that's politics. And you just want to shake him. And yes, you know they're 17. And and by now, they're I think they're all like 20 at this point now. I think it was taped uh, two years ago, three years ago. But my God, you just want to shake these kids. Like, what are you doing? You're, I mean, because they're all going to go into some sort of you know mainstream politics, whatever. At least most of them. Most of them will. He's definitely going to end up running the RNC one day and loving it. But my God, it was just it just watching him operate and use like smear tactic. Yeah, here's Robert McDougall. See, kind of little feathered hair, you know, typical, mm, yeah. uh, <laughs> whatever. Uh, and, and, At the very <laughs> least, they're going to law school, you know. <laughs> you know yeah, exactly. They're going to be you know, young Cruz the making. And then this also is another, he's also a secondary hero, Renee. You know, uh, uh, he's just, I mean, this picture right now is everything. This is Renee in a nutshell. Doesn't have time. <laughs> you don't have time for that shit. You know, you don't have time for that. <laughs> Ain't nobody got time for that. That's Renee in a capsule. He's a savvy uh, campaign manager, Stephen. Just totally, I mean, very plugged in, very, you know, very self possessed young man. Also a raging Democrat, but also really knows how to work a room and a natural born order. I just love Renee so much. To the and he's he's such a, a, a polarizing figure that they actually made Insta hate Instagram accounts to troll him during during one of these elections. It's all in a week. Oh, it's nuts. So yeah, so boy <laughs> state. I know this is just there they are facing off two arch enemies. It's just and he has the best quote of the entire movie. He says. He said when asked about during his confessional about uh, Ben as as uh, uh, an opponent, he said, "Yeah, I think Ben is an excellent politician, but I don't think that's much of a compliment either." 
Oh, Is that since you know people who, who who have seen this movie or who who are who have been in Boy State, I hardly uh, implore you to watch it as, as soon as possible. It's so good, and 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 definitely jump into our into our group Slack uh, in in uh, television. Ping me and and uh, who else we fell in love with? I think it was uh, Omid and Emily. Shout outs to the Brassy Slack. <laughs> Hit us up when because you, you will fall in love with Stephen Garza. Mm -hmm. I I will vote for whatever if I'm eligible to vote for him, and he's just the beating heart of this movie. Oh, I love this movie so much, Boy State. Awesome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, what's your? I'm sorry, I, I totally dominate the entire thing, but I love Boy State. Check it out. What's your next film, Jen? Um, so I went for um, you know a '90s rom com. Um, I went for Hope Floats with uh, Harry Connick Jr. and Sandra Bullock. You look what? like you know the film. <clears throat> I think I saw this in the theater. I barely remember mm -hmm. it, but yes, bring us up to speed. Um, so there, like when I was thinking back to like te Texas movies, like there's this scene in a dance hall, and like that's very much a, a part of a part of. Uh, life, especially in uh, in this part of like Central Texas, or you know, through through most of the state, actually. Um, also, um, I was a, I've been a huge Harry Connick Jr. fan since the mid '90s, so I was like, oh, he's gonna be in a feature film. Yes, I will be there. You know, uh, San this is Sandra Bullock. You know, in the height of her her rom com her, her rom com sweetheart uh, phase and. Um, I enjoyed it a lot. The mother is kind of, the, it's this kooky, uh, you know, that she moves, she moves back home after, if, you know, her husband has an, um, has an affair and she's told about it on like a Jerry Springer like talk show, you know, so she basically moves back home in, in shame and she, you know, hasn't had a job since she, you know, uh, that, that whole type of, you know, she got married and her job was to be a mom that, you know, that whole a kind of privileged existence. Um, and so she's having to adjust to, you know, ordinary life. And the mom is kind of kooky and also like a kind of, a, a kind of Texas, a certain type of Texas character. I can't remember who plays my mom right now. That's escaping me, but. Um, oh, the young Mae Whitman. Yes, yes. <laughs> Um, she's a, a Molly Ivins type, so like you know, like a kind of text to tough talking Texas icon. Oh, yes, yeah. uh, Gina Rollins. Yeah. yeah, so okay. Oh, mm -hmm. Hope floats. All right, can't say I'll rewatch that, but uh, <laughs> that's a, that's a, that's a great off the beaten path pick. Uh, for mm -hmm. my fourth one, I'm going to go with. Okay, I'm gonna go with this one because this you might have a shot at this one. I'll go with Sicario. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, some really nice, bleak Texas landscapes, right? Definitely all about. You need the to be shouting Sicario right now. <laughs> Sicario! <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Sicario! Yeah. <laughs> Second one, which makes no fucking sense. But the first oh, no. one, yeah. awesome. I mean, and I've, I've rewatched this one at least twice. I think I might have seen it twice in the theater. I really, I really dug this one, especially Josh Brolin's, you know, flip flopping, wearing. You know, kind of laid back, but super ruthless uh, CIA operator. You know, never quite. You know, question let's just mark. yeah. Question Emily mark. Blunt is so good in this. Mm -mm. So good, so good is like kind of the. I mean, we think she's kind of tough and she can handle her shit, and then she gets in with some real toughs, and you're like, ooh, okay. Then you realize that she's you know your avatar. She's you know the the the, the vantage point for you as the audience, and you're kind of like, wow, this is nuts. And and basically, yeah. for those who haven't seen Sicario. It's, it's you know definitely about the the border war, uh, uh, you know somewhat about the war on drugs. Most about most about the the border war and how you know trying to stop um, you know a, a big uh, a, a big uh, drug lord out there who's played by uh, now now the, the Sicario in question is Benicio del Toro. But I'm trying to remember who played the, the actual guy. He's very famous. Um, uh, let me I know I'll see I know. Anyways, well, anyways, oh, Daniel uh, Kaluuya, I forgot about that. Yeah, yeah, that this is the one that really kind of put him on my radar because this came out before Get Out. I'm like, oh, this guy's this guy's pretty good, and I looked him up, and I was shocked to find out that, of course, he's British. I mean, of course, him to you know, American <laughs> accent, uh, and and yeah, he was really good in this. Uh, and then there's a nice, I don't know if cameos right, you know, word for it, but an interesting series of scenes with uh, John Bernthal who comes in. Oh yes, yeah. 
definitely announced mm-hmm. its presence with authority. So yeah, I really, I really enjoyed this. Emily Blunt does such excellent work. Um, it, it's a complete movie on its own. They it didn't need a sequel. I'm glad we got a sequel, even though the sequel did not live up to my expectations. But yeah, it's just such be- so beautifully shot. Uh, I think who's the director on this? This is a uh, Vin and Wave, right? D- I think yeah. Yeah. Vin 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 Yeah, Vin and Wave, Vin and Wave. I always I mean I noticed I, I speak French, I'm not even trying to say his name right. But yes, this is Denise. He did his thing, and I think his director of photography on this ended up filming the next Sicario, right? Was that right, I think? Cast and crew, Soya, um, what's his name? Was it produced, cinematography? No, ooh, Roger Deakins. Yo, my bad. <laughs> I mean, to slander your, your name. For those who aren't familiar with Roger Deakins, I mean, check the resume. Cinematographer, 81 credits, stupid paid. He's in everything. Jarhead, No Country for Old Men. Oh, In the Valley, Eli. That also might qualify for Texas movie. Oh, yeah. Oh, Brother, The Hurricane, The Sea. I mean, this dude has been stop <laughs> for like 40 years. Look at 75. This guy's been working as long as I've been born. I'm 44 years old. I was born in 75. He has not stopped working. Look at this. Da, 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 da. Take that. Take that. Beautiful mind. Take that. And Tom Crowley, take that. Seriously, take that. And what's the last one he's done? The Goldfinch. 1917? 1917. Ah, take that. He'd be filming right now if it weren't for the damn pandemic. Yo, Roger <laughs> kids, get that. Skyfall, beautiful. Yo, my bad, Roger. Blade Runner, yeah. Yeah, 2049. Get your, Oscar. Get, your, get, your, get your flowers, my man. Get your flowers. All right, so <laughs> Sicario is mine. What is your fifth and final pick, Jen? Um, my fifth and final pick, um, I will... I, I stand by it, uh, is Varsity Blues. Oh. The MTV version of Friday Your Night Lights. Your life. Your life, yes. Ah, how did I miss that? That is the perfect Texas movie. And it's got sports. Oh, excellent. Excellent, excellent. excellent. I'm so jealous. Well done. Tell us about Varsity Blues. Um, <laughs> so it's kind of the, it's the MTV or kind of poppy version of, um, and I think this was maybe one of the first films that like MTV did under their own shingle. Right. Uh, I remember it being um, mar- it being marketed pretty heavily because that would have been, you know, since you and I are of a certain age, you know, we would actually be watching MTV all the time, you know, <laughs> and and seeing the, the it being you know advertised there. Of course, you've got you've got Paul Walker. James right. Vanderbeek, um, I, you know, wasn't super well known necessarily at the time. And oh, although, of course, in, in Dawson's Creek at this point. Oh, that's right. That was yeah, around 97. Yeah. yeah, he was a okay. big But not a movie star. No, no. Well, he's yeah. still not a movie star. But yeah, this is his shot at movie star. <laughs> didn't quite work out, but it is a cult classic. <laughs> yeah, he's trying. And, and, you know, John Voight as the asshole coach is, you know, just spot on also like you know i knew a lot of coaches like that you know particularly playing you know people who are injured you know past you know, past whenever they should you know so um yeah it's just you know it it's there's a lot of fun parts part um quotable yep. lines things like that so young brian robbins former <laughs> actor turned uh producer director on his nice. first uh on his first film yeah <laughs> Uh, his first uh, directorial film, I think. He, he directed this, didn't he? Or did he just produce it? I think he might have directed it. Scott Kahn playing, I mean, you know, Scott Kahn, basically a young shithead. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he you continued know. that in, you know, in Ocean, in the Oceans trilogy. <laughs> yeah, all right. Yeah. Pick, yes. I don't want your life. <laughs> and then my sister and I, we still, t- like, quote, in that same scene, you know, the, the dad... The, you know, Dawson's dad is trying to encourage him to, you know, throw the football and he's like, fire up that fucking pigskin. Like, we still <laughs> quote that all the time, you know, so <laughs> in its own way, you know, it, it is very, it is also true to that, to that Friday Night Lights, that college, or sorry, the high school football experience. And also the play, the players being revered as gods, you know, and all that goes along with that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Texas, so Texas. Such a great it's day. true. <laughs> Yeah. Even though the accent's terrible, but you know that's all there right. It is. The whipped cream bikini. I didn't. I wasn't, I wasn't looking for. It. I swear, I was just checking the pictures. Amy, 
<laughs> and Amy, yeah, Ali Larder, and then you have Amy Smart, like, you, talk, you know, asking him about about the whipped cream bikini, because that's her, you know, her attempt at a Southern accent, a Texas accent, so. I mean, mm -hmm. alienating our, our female uh, uh, viewers and watchers, of which there must be at least six. Uh, I, that will not be our cover photo for Instagram, but I'm sure <laughs> Wait, so I did. Wow. Yeah. Very Texas. And everyone, and everyone would know what film was from, too. And the, the iconic whipped cream bikini. And <laughs> I thought in the theater, when it happened, I thought, I mean, of course, I'm like, wow and whoa, but I had no idea it'd be as iconic as it was. I, I mean, it, it's. Yeah. The, I mean, even by by today's terms, I'm not even sure it's that risque, but just the audacity of just kind of I mean, it's like it's like on 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 um what would they call it on How I Met Your Mother doing the Naked Man, you know, it's yes. just like, <laughs> like out of the box play. That's what the whipped cream bikini was an audacious out of the box play. When and then, you know, it, get, it gets spoofed in not another teen movie with Chris Evans, you know. <laughs> Woo, I'm sure that was been a close set that day. All right. Anyway, <laughs> uh, Varsity Blues. I, I can't even top that. That's, that's way to go out. Way, way to drop the mic. My fifth one is Jason's lyric. It's such oh, yeah. Houston black. Yeah. I mean, my gosh, it's a treach. It's a great <laughs> choice. What's thank you? What's Tretch even doing in this movie? He's not from Houston. Anyways, love is current. <laughs> and I'm I've got a lot of conflicting feelings about this. This is definitely of an age and of a time. 1994, sophomore year in, in college for me. It, it down in Morehouse. I remember seeing it at the CNN Center in Atlanta. <laughs> little baby Eddie Griffin. Look at him. I know, right? Look at little, little, little Eddie, a very young <laughs> Jada uh, Pinkett Smith. Tretch. Tretch actually could act, but I still have no idea what, what he's doing in this movie. Uh, it's so Houston. And Alan Payne. Oh my goodness. Goodness gracious. So Alan Payne, light skin god of of the light skin, dark skin wars back then. He was, he was in this movie. And Bokeem Woodbine, the Woodbine Assance is in full effect here. Uh, actually, uh, and actually, this is before he actually had a stretch, I think, from 94 through. Basically, to the aughts, dead presidents included, where you know, Bokeem, the star was on the rise. Don't know what quite happened to it. Must hit that invisible uh, black male actor ceiling, but he's now making a comeback. He was in that uh, movie, Spencer Confidential, doing great. Oh, okay. Good to see him back. Uh, back in black. Forrest Whitaker, everyone's in this movie, damn it. And Alan Payne, just really going for it in this movie. He's just a guy totally in love with Jada Pinkett Smith's character. And this is before stalking laws were enacted because I swear he comes for her for like half the movie. She's like, no, no, Heisman, hell no. But yet somehow he just wears her down. And mm -hmm. I know, and all the sisters I knew, especially on their landing, came out this movie talking like, yeah, I want me a man like like Jason. I want me, you know, I want me a man to court me like Jason's lyric. And I'm looking like, hey, shit, you tell me no twice, I'm good. It's not yeah. that serious. Today he'd be a fucking stalker. What are we talking about? <laughs> so that that was their idea of what romance and love was back then. I don't think it is so much no, no, anymore. Yes, she's you know Jada Pinkett Smith as as the titular lyric. It's the titular role. <laughs> the titular uh, lyric is uh, is I mean she's you know she's pretty and feisty and awesome and worth it, but she's not worth being denied for half a damn movie worth. That sex scene, hot, so hot. <laughs> So I, I, I mean, it's it's still a, a good watch for sure. I haven't revisited it in a while. I might need to rewatch it. Um, but yeah, I just thought he played himself out so hard in the first half of this movie. But eventually, he got the girl. So I guess it was worth it. I don't know. Good soundtrack. I, <laughs> I didn't. I didn't realize um, in preparing Forrest Whitaker. Like I didn't realize until I was preparing for today that like he directed Hope Floats. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so it's yeah, so it's like such a that's such a bizarre movie to, on your filmography. Yeah, actually, I'm gonna do a quick cultural cul de sac. Let's see it. <laughs> uh, I just want to see what he's directed because that is kind of bizarre. Like, what are you, Forrest Whitaker? Oh, uh, that's a title. No, as a as a guy. No, no, go back. Who yeah, title? Pop live tour. Oh, I see. Uh, people, there we go. Yeah, I want to see what he's directed. Because I'm sure it's been like, you know, a movie, 170, 127 credits. <laughs> Go ahead, get your checks. Eight credits, <laughs> strapped, okay. Video short, video short. 
He directed Wayne. Oh. Oh. I did not remember that either. Wow. And then that explains the shoot. This is so bizarre. <laughs> and then that's it. He's like, I'm out. I'm done. And first daughter was fun. I enjoyed first daughter. It's like the Katie Holmes one, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I liked it fun. It was cool. All right. Well, cool. All right, great. Those are our five. <laughs> No segues allowed, damn it. We're moving on. So we're going to take a short break for those who are listening to the podcast at home. Great stuff. And when we come back, we, uh, we will talk more about the quarantine movie of the week. And those who are listening to the podcast, take a break to listen to what our Cinema Draft company is about and the draft stream game and how it is played. We will be right back right after this. And we're back. All right, so our quarantine movie of the week last week was Searching, that thriller where John Cho is a father trying to find his missing daughter who may or may not be kidnapped using the technology of our time. I loved it. Have you seen Searching, Jen? Yes, it's. I, I love it, especially as, as that kind of... It's not necessarily found footage, but like you said, like, you know, very little is like actually like a, like a traditional film. You get to see it through the different type of technology that that he's using. And, um, you know, you've got the great I, I really like the, the, the twist ending, you know, too. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you think it's going to go a certain way and using all of those different vantage points like security cameras and things like that, it makes it. It was just, it's very inventive and uh, John Cho, like, put him in all the things, please, you know. Yeah, mm -hmm. what's the hashtag? Put, get John Cho a, a rom com or something? I mean, yeah. <laughs> I, I love that one season, like, uh, show Selfie. I thought he was great in it. And Karen mm -hmm. Gillan was so charming. So yeah. charming. She totally nailed that mm -hmm. accent. And another, I think she's Irish for crying out loud, who just totally kills an American accent. It's I love weird. him as Sulu in the in the reboot, you know, of, of Star, Star Trek. Wars, Star, Star, Star Trek. Trek. Jesus, <laughs> don't, don't add us. Don't add her. <laughs> All right. So our quarantine movie of the week this week is Jojo Rabbit. Hi, Jojo. <laughs> now, yeah, you. I think you mentioned off air you haven't seen it. Jojo Rabbit is adorable. It's the active imagination of a lonely boy during Nazi Germany who is interrupted by the discovery of a young Jewish girl who's hiding out in his attic. ScarJo is his mother, and she's totally charming, especially pre-problematic phase. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, there, there is this. And Thomason McKenzie. You know, she also reminds me of uh, Esme Creed Miles, who plays uh, Hannah on the, the TV series Hannah. They, they definitely favor each other. But uh, this is Thomason McKenzie, who was also great in the little scene indie. Um, was it No? Was it No Left? No One Left Behind? Not Left Behind? What was that movie? Leave No Trace. There we go. Something okay. be not left. <laughs> Leave No Trace. She was in that. She's, she's a great, promising young actor. Uh, I also, I, yeah, I saw her in The King. She was good in that. And yeah, so she's she's just getting started. Uh, she's uh, she plays the 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 girl hiding on the attic. They have a very unlikely friendship because he's he's basically in Nazi youth. Um, young, uh, uh, what's his name? Oh, they don't even have his name on the marquee. How how rude! He was really good. Uh, young child actor. What is this? Let me find out what his name is. Oh, I don't remember. Roman Griffin Davis. There we go. Young RGD. He was killing it, and Taika Waititi, who also directed this, I believe, he played um, he played Hitler, who's his imaginary friend. <laughs> we all had imaginary friends growing up. Mine's name was Penelope. His was named Hitler. A little different, <laughs> but this is a very, I mean, Hitler, obviously, for lots of different reasons in lots of real-world contexts, is not funny, but he definitely plays a buffoonish uh, version of Hitler, who is, you know, buffoonishly funny at times, but yet still a big bag of dicks. Anyways, <laughs> Scarlett Johansson encourages his his imagination, stuff like that, and is the one who's harboring the, the Jewish girl hiding out in Nazi Germany, because that was definitely during the time when they were rounding up Jews, sending them off to concentration camps and gassing them, which is definitely 
very, 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 very bad. But this is such a, a mo unexpected movie with heart. There, I know there's a lot of people, and I, I might have, you might have missed my comment in the Slack this week about it. But I am really over outrage culture as far as and not, and that's I'm not saying I, I mean cancel culture doesn't exist. It's not a thing. It's something. It's people who hate consequences being called heel. I'm talking about preemptive outrage culture. Basically, someone says, "Oh, they're gonna make a movie about this," and even if it sounds like a bad idea, whatever. I'm, you know. Even if, I mean, if so, there are things that maybe not are for you generally, okay, fine. I don't do horror. That's fine. Doesn't mean I don't think they should exist. It's just not for me. I'm definitely right. people who are like, oh, you know, this movie about a young boy whose best friend is Hitler. No, fuck that movie. Uh, <laughs> never gonna see it. It's bad. I'm like, well, how about we see it first or hear other people's experiences about it first before we totally pre cancel it? I don't know. Right. Call me. <laughs> That's just the artist in me, the writer in me. Like, I'm one of those very few people who was like, who, when they heard about Confederate, like, oh, well, first of all, I love alt history, so I'm, I'm in on that to begin with, but it's got talented people attached to it. The Spellmans, uh, I think, uh, uh, Nichelle Tramble Spellman and, and Malcolm Spellman, very talented, long running uh, TV show uh, showrunners and writers, you know, who are also teaming up with the Davids, David Benioff and D.B. Weiss. Uh, to uh, to work in Confederate about an alt history if slavery had had never ended or whatever and I and yes on the face of it it sounds egregious personally I would rather see it before I totally canceled it so in any way in any event it's not coming out but I'm just I'm just saying that this is the type of movie that's a perfect example of why you can't just cancel something on on the concept alone if there are talented people attached to it who might be making it in good faith. And that's definitely what happened. I thought it was enjoyable. It was a great film. Probably one of my top 10 of 2019. I saw it with my mom. I saw it with my mom. <laughs> nice. and, and she enjoyed it too. And yeah, it's it's unexpected. And there's this funny part, the whole, hi, Jojo, for those who've seen it. I won't spoil it for you if you intend on seeing it. But there's a funny thing with a young boy and a rocket launcher saying, hi, Jojo, which I will never forget. <laughs> hi, Jojo. So um, did, did, did Taika win the Oscar for this? Or I'm trying to remember what Oscars this won, because I know I, there were, it was nominated for several I'm different ones. Pretty sure it won, won one Oscar. It's got to be for, for screenwriting, right? Let me see. I think so. Yes, Best Adapted yeah. Screenplay, Taika. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, so that's our, our quarantine movie of the week. Check it out this week and tweet us your tweet length review at Play Cinema Draft which is our Twitter account, and tell us what you think. And give it a chance, damn it. Never know what you're <laughs> to cover. All right, and so now it is time for our draft stream update. I will keep it mercifully brief since you have not and will not play because you're so busy teaching young minds, but you are always welcome. It is a free-to-play game. We give out $50 per week in our prize pool, $35 to first, $15 to second to the top two Non Cinema Draft affiliated call sheets, and we've got a big winner this week. Henner YYZ, also from Baranski Slack, in only his third week playing. His oh, art okay. <laughs> game, check it out. And yes, and he did it on the strength of, like I mentioned, the vow, a late breaking comer. He came from behind to to beat our perennial winners, Gamble Twenty Four X Seven and jaybird as you see came in second and third respectively came from behind vaulted vaulted five spots i think thanks to the sunday premiere of the vow and actually i'll tell you the score that did it for him it was this right here 8.4 on imdb user rating that's what vaulted him from from fifth to first and actually and it was very uh it was very cool to to review his call sheet because he had a bit of a diversified strategy, which has been all the rage this week. He had, oh, where'd he go? He had headliner stack of the vow here, headliner stack of the 24th, which I started watching last night. I think I started too late because I started to fall asleep. It's not boring. It's a little earnest, a little, little trekly, but I'm, 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 I'm enjoying it. It's interesting. Uh, it's historical fiction about, I guess, an all black regiment of the military back during World War One, where they had hopes of going off to fight in France. Instead, they're kept home and made to to build, you know, some uh, yes. army. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yes, I did want to see this. Yeah, yeah. So I, I discovered it through this through this game last week, and am, am in the process of checking it out. He also had headliner stack of Lucifer paid up for it. Our two most expensive actors on the slate: Tom Ellis, Lauren Germain. 
Lucer, Lucifer season five. So he, he, he paid he paid dearly for it, but it came out for him in the end. It was also our highest scoring title on the slate this week, extracting 162 points each. Awesome. And then a three pack of love in the time of Corona, which was a bit of a gamble, a bit of a wild card. We were not sure if people would come watch something filmed uh, in isolation, uh, an anthology of stories. I mean, good actors, as you can see, Leslie Odom Jr. and his w lovely wife, Nicolette Robinson, uh, were two of the headliners he snagged for his call sheet. But people turned out, they, they seemed to like it and got some decent critical uh, acclaim. Let's see, what did it do? Yeah, here we go. It did, okay, actually, yeah, so it got 80, oh, actually critics were lukewarm on it. Didn't get a Rotten Tomatoes critic score, but it did get a so-so mm, Metacritic score. But audiences, 85% on Google user, which is great, and a 5.8 on IMDb. So all that being said, so congrats again to Henner YYZ winning Gamble 24X7, won our lowball competition. Uh, and that's uh, if, uh, if you're interested jen you have two ways you, you can win each week you get up to three call sheets so you get three cracks at it you can either go for the high ball spot 35 dollars for first or you can go for the low ball where in this case you must have at least three different titles on your call sheet you must have at least one headliner one co-star one day player from the talent pool you must also spend at least seventy five thousand dollars in your on your uh out of your budget and you are aiming for the lowest point scored. All okay. right. Yeah. So that's mm -hmm. how that's how uh, G twenty four won ten dollars this week for the low ball bonus. He did it on the strength of Single Town. Nobody liked that damn show. Sixty five point <laughs> nine zero before it's underneath our default score of sixty nine point five. So that movie sucked. Or that that show sucked. And then the Pale Door, video on demand, fifty one, big stinker. So well done, G twenty four. And I and are you ready for this week's crop of talent pool? All right, let's let's see it. All right, so this week, twenty fresh hot ones, lot to discuss. You cannot kill David Arquette, a video on demand documentary. Fun fact about isn't David Arquette a Texan? Is he from Texas? Oh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I just want he's from Texas. Uh, quick cultural cul-de-sac. I actually. Uh, played basketball against David Arquette once. Very random. L.A. in the aughts. Uh, I, I was, was going to say, this must be an L.A. story. <laughs> L.A. story. Uh, went to go play. It was like 12 in the afternoon, like on a Tuesday. And I, I was living the writer lifestyle, so, you know, I, I could do that. But uh, one of my friends, I think, yeah, one of my, one of my friend's uh, brother-in-law, he was a teacher of summertime, so he's off. We go to some gym in mid-Wilshire, and uh, it's like playing, you know, um, like you know, make uh, uh, what well, we call it booties up north. I think it's called twenty one everywhere else. Uh, you know, you know, one on one on one on one. And David Arquette was there playing. You know, a little shorter than me. I'm six feet. So he must be like maybe five nine, five ten. Very very thick calves. I'll never forget that. Like his calves are really thick. <laughs> This is remarkable. Yes. <laughs> you have thick calves that thick and be an actor? Wow. And like, <laughs> he has calves that thick and gets to, go, gets to go home to Courtney Cox at the time? Yes. Mm -hmm. wow. So, yeah, that's my David Arquette story. Yeah, okay, ball ball player. Not much of a handle. Yeah, in, infrequent jump shot. You know, I he's okay ball player. That's my David Arquette story. So he's got a, a documentary on himself. I think he's going into MMA and wrestling now. Bizarre. Tyler Perry showed up this week. Ugh, Lord save us. <laughs> Season two of Trinkets. Have you seen Trinkets yet? I have not. Oh, but I did see the trailer today. Uh, so it looks interesting. Oh, uh, it, it looks like something I would like. <laughs> charming 30 minute episodes in and out like that. Uh, I mean, basically Shopaholics Anonymous uh, trio of high schoolers uh, bond through their, their support group. And you know they do it. You know they, they do it for all the normal reasons, but also some deeper ones. Like it's you know people who have you are feeling sense of shame or or disconnection, and they steal for the thrill of it. So that's kind of what uh, Trink is about. Very comely young cast who are all doing some interesting stuff. Uh, I've seen her in in I think the Bruno and Boots uh, um, TV show adaptation of the books. Do you, did you ever read Bruno and Boots when you were a kid? I never did. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know what they are? Those those, those books, the kid no. books. 
Yeah, very well. I mean, I'm probably I'm probably a little older than you. They're they're really big for me in my formative years. I still have some of them somewhere, unless my mom gave them all away. But I used to love the Bruno and Boots stories because they're basically these bunch of Canadian kids at a boarding school. These two these two mischievous kids named Bruno and Boots. <laughs> Can you imagine? Oh, fun. Yeah, written by Gordon Gordon Corman, and he just crank. I mean, this guy's ancestors will be living off of, or our descendants will be living off of the money he made up with Bruno and Boots books. I guess they got him turned into like a Netflix series, whatever. And she's in there. I kind of started watching it and I just couldn't get through it. It's not the same as the books, damn it. But yeah, she's great. Kiana Madeira, Brianna Hildebrand. I've seen a couple other things. And oh also, yeah. Oh yeah. What have you seen Brianna in? I'm, try I'm trying to remember, but she looks, um, oh, um, Kimmy Schmidt, right? Oh, okay. In the, in, the, I, in the picture before, the it, was she the person on the right? Oh, oh, uh, Quintessa Swindell. She's definitely getting around. She's great. Yeah, gorgeous, tall. Uh, saw her in uh, what did I see? Euphoria. Yeah, she hmm. was in Euphoria. So yeah, so she's starting to, to to come up. And they filmed this in Portland. So shout out to the Pacific Northwest. Cool. So I am I am uh, working my way through Euphoria now too. So I, I'm I'm always late. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you're, I'm you're, very excited about Bill and Ted, though. <laughs> Bill and Ted face the music. Yes, this is our most expensive title on the slate. Uh, seventeen thousand eight hundred for Keanu Reeves, seventeen thousand three hundred for Alex Winter. Uh, I'm not sure if you're aware, but you only get a hundred thousand for your call sheet of ten actors, and you must get ten, no more, no oh. less. Yeah, so this is almost twenty percent of your of your budget. So, but I think it's going to be a lot of nostalgia in play. A lot of name wreck, a lot of, oh, this would have gone to the theater, so it's coming to VOD, let me check it out, had the looky lose. So, <clears throat> so yeah, so I think it's going to do well. That's why it's at 17800 I think our value play of the week this week is, where was it? The It might be BT, well, no, not, actually not, not this one. It might be the bounce. Where'd it go? Oh, no, no, Hulu. There we go. The binge. Now, this is Hulu. Now, in our game, one thing we've noticed, and we've got now a full five months, 20 weeks worth of data on, on uh, our game. One thing we've noticed is that Hulu kind of stands for quality. Hulu's got some of the highest scoring titles in the game, both popular with critics and with audiences. So I think the binge might be your source for hidden value here. Uh, Skylar Gizondo, you remember him from? Oh, uh, both of them are from Booksmart. Yeah, the guy on the right also. Booksmart and also actually you're right. Booksmart and I was gonna say he was he was in um uh, Santa Clarita. Right? Santa Clarita I, diet? Probably that <laughs> sorry. No, 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 it's fine, it's great. I know he's in he's in all these things. Probably I, I'm not down with cannibalism, so I couldn't get myself there. But he's in he, he's in the one with uh, little baby Billy. Little baby Billy. Uh, what's the name of that show? Um Little Baby Billy and the and the, the church, the, the spoof on the churches. Um you know, you never saw the one? Oh, okay, I'm gonna look it up real quick. <laughs> it's uh you named all the ones except the one I was thinking of. Uh Righteous Jefferson. There we <laughs> oh, go. Oh, okay. I still haven't seen that either. Oh, that's right. You're always late. Never mind. All right. Well, anyway, I, know. Great show. I heard so many good things. It's just it's on the list. <laughs> yeah, very fun, very, very cool show. Yeah, uh, Danny McBride. Anyway, Scala Gazano's getting around, but it's um the binge. Uh, Vince Vaughn also, 12,100. Hulu, those shows tend to score 95 points or more. You generally want to get at least 9.7 points per thousand. So this definitely has a shot at, at, the, at the, the hundreds, maybe one tens. So this might be your source of hidden value as well as. Uh, I'm happy to see Chris Gethard as a headliner. Mm -mm. Oh, what was that in? What'd you see him in? Uh, um, but it was next to Jimmy Kimmel. To me, oh, oh, that must, oh, that was a documentary. What was, that was, what was the one I was looking at? Documentary for Chris Gethard. Oh no, he's um, I think he's directing that one. Is that? Oh, the, okay. That must be. I, I, I think I know which one you're talking about. It must be like the documentary. I think. Chris. Oh, there he is. Yeah. Oh no, yeah, the doctor. Yeah. Oh, he's not. I'm sorry, he's not directing. He's actually the headliner. Yeah, class action park. He's in the documentary about, I think it's uh about like a, a bad theme park. Jersey. Yeah, theme park. yeah. He has a like, he's a Jersey comic, and um he has like a whole a whole section of of an of an album about about this park, and it's I just I keep seeing all these crazy stories. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I guess Jimmy Kimmel might have worked there back in the day or something. So oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay, very interesting. So yeah, this one also should probably do pretty well. Um, and yeah, HBO Max tends to skew up as well. Documentaries, they start off hot in our game. They've kind of tailed off. But 7,800 might be some hidden value here for all of you draft stream players. And yes, once again, I do encourage you to play. It's free to play. Three call sheet max. Everyone who's going to play, get those call sheets in by 6 p.m. Pacific time Thursday. And, you know, some of y'all are at home, out of work, got time on your hands. You got nothing better to do. Come get this money. All right. Okay, so we'll bring this in for a landing. Give yourself a hand, Jen. Thanks for being on the pod. Thank you for having me. We appreciate you. No, very few technical difficulties. Thank you, Google <laughs> Meet. I look forward to paying the $25 a month, damn it, for G Suite. And <laughs> this is the time I ask my guests who, who perform so admirably to give something back. You know, Go ahead and, and plug your ish. Anything to plug. Um, well, I don't really have anything, anything personally to plug, but, um, I recommend that, um, if you're looking for, if you're looking for laughs, a good, another good podcast is, a uh, it's called Dumb People Town, um, and it's run from the Slar Brothers, who are, uh, stand-up comedians, and then Daniel Van Kirk, uh, another comedian, and they kind of, you know, take these, take these stories that are completely absurd and kind of break them apart. And so I, I really enjoy that one. <clears throat> All right. Well, you know what? A teacher giving to the end, educating us on what we need to be listening to. She has nothing to plug. So she plugs someone else's stuff. Ah, just great stuff, Jen. We appreciate you around here. Thank <laughs> you everybody for listening and watching. We'll be back again on next week with another great guest, with another top five. Actually, we kind of gave it away. It'll be Steph Lava. She'll be in the house. Top five American Lat- Latinx movies. Check us out next week. And also, check out the Draft Stream game and the Draft Stream pod. Strategy pod coming to you sometime after the 6 p.m. Pacific time Thursday game lock. We chop it up and get into the titles and the strategy. Thanks for watching, everyone. Thanks for listening. And quarantine with a movie or something. We'll see you all later.